So yeah, my name is Carolyn and I'm a software developer and Mozilla tech speaker based in Berlin, Germany. I'm currently working as an open source engineer at a machine learning startup called Mishkin. And part of my job there is to maintain the documentation for our products. Um, alternating between front end development and technical writing tasks, I've learned many ways that accessibility principles can benefit documentation. And that's what I want to share with you today. So during the next 30, 35, I don't even know, 40 minutes, I'm going to throw a lot of resources at you. So I've included the link to, and it has a list of every article or tool that I'll reference. And that's also where my slides are if you want to follow along. And I'll also show this again at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's get started. Looking at this first slide, I know what some of you might be thinking. Like, what the heck is a double one Y, a 11 Y, or really whatever's on the screen right now. So this is pronounced as Ali, and you might be familiar with it if you've ever heard of I-18N because they're both alphanumeric acronyms. This means that the letter between, the letters between the first and the last have been replaced by a number representing the number of missing letters. This A11Y format is popularly used across the web to discuss accessibility. It's a hashtag on Twitter, a category on the practical dev, and there's a community-driven initiative called the Alley Project, whose goal is to help developers make their websites and applications more accessible. So now that acronyms are out of the way, let's talk about what accessibility actually is. So Laura Callback outlines this well in her book titled Accessibility for Everyone. She defines accessibility in the physical world as the degree to which an environment is usable by as many people as possible. And web accessibility is the degree to which websites are usable. We can think of both kinds of accessibility as forms of inclusion. This concept of inclusion has been finding its stride in the web development community, and it's not that difficult to figure out why. According to the World Health Organization, there are over 1 billion people globally who need an assistive device. And with statistics like these, organizations and open source projects alike um, realize that they could be unintentionally locking people out of their products. Accessibility can play a huge role in enhancing people's experiences online. But in order to have our products be actually useful, we need to start understanding that people access the web very differently. Assistive technology is just one of those ways. One of the most talked about forms of assistive technology is a screen reader. This software takes the information that's on the screen and turns out a Siri-like output. Um, audio signals, or even sometimes braille. So this is a now outdated screenshot of a project that I was working on with another Berlin-based developer, Sarah Vieira. There aren't that many components. There's a search bar, heading, text, some links. Uh, so let's see how a screen reader would consume this page. And I will warn you <laughs> in advance that when I did the tech check yesterday, the audio was really difficult to hear on the other end. So I'm aware and I'm gonna make you watch it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and I'll include, so in the list of resources, there's also all of the videos that I will play during this presentation. Also, if you're able to, um, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see what the screen reader is reading out loud. So I don't know, let's, let's see how this goes. Cool, so besides being great for catching typos, as you might have noticed, uh, screen readers have now made this web page accessible for those with visual impairments. Another common form of assistive technology is keyboard navigation. So this is when a person uses only their keyboard to access a computer or website. Screen readers are often, but not always, paired with keyboard navigation. 
Shopify's developer portal is a great example because it is fully keyboard accessible and our focus as a user follows the visual flow of the page. While this talk will focus mainly on screen readers and keyboards, accessibility on the web isn't limited to just that. Uh, people have varying needs, and so we've created a diverse range of tools to match those needs. There's navigation hardware, which is generally similar to a hand-operated mouse, but they might be operated with your mouth or your feet or a touch screen. Or switch inputs. With switch inputs, the software moves throughout options on the screen and people trigger the switch when their desire option, desired option is highlighted. Or trackers, which rely on cameras to analyze the movement of a user's eyes or head and navigate the screen or take action for them. All of these technologies can help a wider range of humans engage with and on the web, but they can only help people to a certain extent. So we need to think about how we program our sites and optimize for other success. And fortunately for us, there's a strong business case for accessibility. Studies show that accessible websites have better SEO and usability. They encourage positive coding practices and help us comply with any legal requirements uh, regarding accessibility online. But the thing is, while a lot of people have realized this benefit for their products, it often ends there. Documentation is left out of the conversation. And I don't know, I would say that's a big problem because if documentation is meant to serve as this tool for learning, discovery, comprehension, in the case of open source, a lot of onboarding and contributing, then it must be included in those conversations. One excuse that I hear frequently is that, quote, documentation is for developers. And this statement is problematic for a lot of reasons, but let's start with one statistic. The Stack Overflow Developer Survey from 2019 indicated that out of the nearly 90,000 participants, one out of every 66 software developers indicated that they are blind or hard of sight. And this will probably be <laughs> the only time you see me quote the Stack Overflow survey. But if we think about how narrow the participant set was in terms of like demographics, um, we can imagine that there are probably so many others out there who weren't accounted for people who are probably trying to read our documentation. So take free code camp contributor, Florian Byers. He was born blind, but he's able to code using a standard issue laptop. He wrote a blog post where he explained that inaccessible docs and tutorials were his biggest pain point while learning. He writes, the tutorials were undoubtedly good, but were completely unreadable for me then goes on to explain some of the details on like what those documentation writers might have missed. And as I mentioned before, I understand that accessibility can be a lot to think about. Uh, but the reality is, is that most of us are already doing some form of accessibility, whether or not we realize it. So ensuring that the layout of our page is logical and follows standard conventions. Uh, crafting user flows and learning journeys to fit a variety of use cases, providing content in multiple languages, and testing that content between Chrome, Firefox, Safari, mobile, what have you. Uh, these are all considered forms of accessibility. So we need to make sure that our products and the supporting documentation are accessible to all users, including users with needs that are different than our own. And to put it bluntly, this is our responsibility as the people who are writing the documentation or building it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's our responsibility. Ruined my own line, okay? But anyway, so it's our responsibility as the people who write the documentation, even if we are not the ones coding it. So Ann Gibson, an access independent accessibility consultant, puts this really well. She says, we may or may not be responsible for writing the HTML, but if the developers we're working with don't produce semantic structure, then they're not actually representing the structures that we're building in our designs. 
So whether you are an engineer, a technical writer, an information architect, or something in between, you can have a hand in making your docs accessible. So how can we actually accomplish this? Maybe I got you on board. Let's see how we do it. So let's start with structure and hierarchy. When you work as a technical writer, I used to be a technical writer back in my previous life. Typically, the first thing you learn is that well-structured content is the best foundation for great documentation. And the same can be said for accessibility. A good question to ask could be, would someone be able to scan this, quickly scan this document and understand the material? Using subheadings to differentiate sections or breaking text into like short logical chunks helps sighted users, sure, but it can also help those using screen readers. But then we need to ask ourselves another question. Is the markup clean and structured? Laura Kalbag describes this well, um, describes that well-structured HTML um, is the secret weapon, quote unquote, of accessibility. And that's because when we write well-structured HTML without altering the default behaviors, our page becomes naturally accessible. Take these examples. So we can use an H1 or heading one tag to describe to the user what this page is about, or a nav tag to clearly indicate the start and end of our navigation. Aside tags can indicate that this content is secondary to the main material, like a sidebar with additional links. Or indicating whether we want a bulleted list, UL, or a numbered list, OL. And fun fact, screen readers will actually read the numbers or say bullet at the beginning of each list item sometimes, even if those have been removed or hidden by CSS. One way that we can examine the page structure without even diving into the code is by looking at the unstyled view. This is roughly the way that it would be read by a screen reader from top to bottom. And small tip, if you're using the Firefox browser, you can view the unstyled view by going to view page style and then select no style. We can also support our HTML with ARIA. So ARIA is a web standard that is particularly useful when it's combined with screen readers. To understand why ARIA is important, we need to think about custom components, things like drag and drop to upload content or progress bars on video and audio. They're great, but they're really far from that document-based behavior that browsers and markup languages were originally designed for. They need a little extra help. So this is where ARIA comes in. There are three main features defined in the ARIA spec, roles, properties, and attributes. ARIA roles define what an element is or does. Roles are used as a layer on top of the existing markup language for elements that don't have implicit roles. The ARIA role is also prioritized by the browser over the HTML tag. For example, if you have a div and you set the role equal to status, then a screen reader will read out that status, that as a status rather than a div. ARIA properties define the properties of an element, which can give them extra meaning or semantics. ARIA labeled by, for instance, allows you to put an ID on an element and then reference it as being the label for anything else that's on the page, including multiple elements, which is impossible using a standard label tag. And finally, ARIA states are special properties that, are, um, that define the current conditions of an element. ARIA hidden is a nice example of this. If an element is only visible after some user action, like, error, like an error message, you can set the ARIA hidden attribute to true. And then once that element is presented, you can set the ARIA hidden attribute to false. States differ from properties in that properties don't change throughout the life cycle of an app, whereas states can change and generally are generally programmed through JavaScript. But there's a time and place for ARIA. For example, like you wouldn't put the attribute like role equals navigation on a nav tag because it already has semantic meaning. It should be placed on divs or spans or other vague elements. 
So next up, that was a big section. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next section, focus indicators. So have you ever noticed those like blue outlines that sometimes show up around links or inputs or buttons? Those outlines are called focus indicators. Browsers by default use a CSS pseudo class to show those outlines um, on elements when they're selected. And they might not be beautiful, but focus indicators let people know which element has focus and helps them understand where they are within your site. The elements that should be focusable are links, form fields, widgets, buttons, and menu items. You can design focus indicators that fit the style of your site and go well with your brand. It's best to create a state that is like highly visible and with good contrast so that it stands out from the rest of the content. And that's why I like this example from gov.uk. It's bright, it's yellow, you see it. And when you're testing your site, you wanna ask yourself questions like, can I tab through this page without getting lost? Do all of the focusable elements have focus states? Can I operate tabs, accordions, search results, um, other dynamic elements with just my keyboard? And do I have a skip navigation link? So for those of you thinking like, huh, what's a skip navigation link? Well, <laughs> skip navigation links, it's, it's way less like charming to do this at a screen, but I'm gonna go with it. So, <laughs> so skip links are an internal page link and are mainly used by screen readers for bypassing or skipping over repetitive web content, web page content. So they're not usually visible on a web page because sighted users can skip over this information by scrolling past it. To show why skip links are necessary, let's take Twilio from 2000, I think the screenshots from 2018 as an example. So the Twilio docs are generally very accessible, a good reference, and they look completely different from this right now. But you'll notice if we take this example and we take away the linked style sheets, there's a lot of menu elements there and it takes time to get to the main content through a screen reader. Adding skip links can help with this, and the MDN web docs are a nice example. They have three different skip links, skip to main content, select language, and skip to search. Images. So images can pose a problem because screen readers aren't smart enough yet to interpret graphics. So we should provide alternative text to help them out. There are two ways that we can do this. So we can do that within the alt attribute of an image element or within the context or surroundings of the image itself. And there are a lot of resources out there to help you write good alt text. So I'll just show you one interesting nuance that I've run into. So this is another site by Sarah, another outdated screenshot of a site by Sarah Vieira, it still works, called Is There Uber In? Which checks to see if there's Uber in a particular city. So you'll notice this search by Algolia at the bottom, and it's actually an image. And at the time, it didn't have any alt text. So let's see how a screen reader would pick this up. And again, I know the audio is an issue. It'll be available later. So in case you missed that, this is what it just read out. And this is because as an attempt to provide useful information, uh, sometimes screen readers will read the file name instead if there's no alt text. So we wanna make sure that our images are being named appropriately as a backup at all times. And if you're tempted to go to Sarah's repo and make a pull request to fix this, don't worry, somebody already did. They actually did it after the first time I gave this talk and it just reaffirmed that I think open source is a wonderful thing. And we can also enable the screen reader to skip over images that are either decoration or not necessary for comprehension, like the globe in the Uber example. And we can do this by adding an alt attribute, but leaving the value blank. Charts and infographics. So these are invaluable to documentation because they can present data in a clear and visual way. 
And providing text alternatives to explain this visual content is usually the most straightforward way to make these accessible, but we don't want to just dump all of the words from an infographic or into a paragraph or spit out all of the data from a graph. When crafting alt text for charts and infographics, we can ask ourselves these questions. What are the highlights and lowlights of the graph? And what are the most important and notable parts? I've also heard that it can help to think about it as if you're like explaining the contents or finding to, to someone over the phone. So let's say we have this bar chart. It really could be anything, to be honest, but let's just say it's the number of iOS versus Android's downloads and our app has per month. We could write out every single detail like this long paragraph describes. Um, sure, this is technically accessible, but it's a little redundant. And I would guess that not all of this information is necessary for the reader to really gain content, context like we're hoping. All we might care about is that there was a significant drop in downloads during the month of June. And once we know what we want to show, we can use that to inform our alt text. So saying something like the lowest amount of downloads occurred in June with 27 iOS and 18 Android. And now that we know what our alt text would say, we need to best, we need to find out the best way to apply that to our charts. At first you might think like, oh, it's an image. So I'll use one of those alt tags that we just talked about. And this can work, um, but there's a more universal way to approach this. More commonly, charts will be programmed as SVGs instead of proper image tags. And that means that even if we put the role equal to image um, and an alt attribute, it's not truly valid. So instead we can use an ARIA label, which works on any tag, or we can even take it a step further and use our ARIA label as the title of the chart, and then um, add an accessible description using the ARIA described by property um, accompanied by a description tag, which isn't rendered as part of the graphic, but can help people who are using assistive technology understand more the context of the chart. Another question that we can ask is, if someone is whether or not if someone can't see colors is the message still clear so elements with more complex information like charts and graphs are especially hard to read when you only use colors to distinguish data like in the example i'm showing i literally can't tell the difference between any of the grayscaled ones um, so we want to use other visual aspects to communicate information, like maybe shapes or labels or size. And you can also try incorporating patterns into your fills to make them the differences even more apparent. Well, okay, it's not, it's not exactly an infographic, but Trello's colorblind mode can provide really good inspiration for adding text and patterns to your charts. If you want to check the contrast of something really quickly, I use Color Oracle. Um, it allows you to grayscale your screen pretty quickly, and there are also options for viewing your screen from the perspective of different types of color blindness. If you're using text and want to make sure that the contrast is compliant with accessibility standards, you can use WebAIM's Color Contrast Checker. In this screenshot, I was actually checking to make sure that the um, the colors in this presentation are accessible. And if you're interested in more information about creating accessible SVG charts specifically with things like dynamic data and skip links, I'd highly recommend Sergi's talk from Inclusive Design 24 event. Code snippets. So code snippets are very and understandably common in documentation. And it's totally possible to make them accessible to screen reader users. We just have to understand what they're expecting to hear. This is an example of an if block in JavaScript, according to a cited user. So we're checking if x is equal to true, and then logging hello world. 
but this is how it would be read out by a screen reader. Some users might turn off notifications for um, parentheses and brackets, or maybe substitute the term like left brace for lace. While it might look verbose to those of us who have sight, um, it is accessible. And to make our, what is it? Ooh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so <laughs> to make our code more accessible, we can follow our semantic HTML principles from earlier and use a code tag um, and try to, you also, you also wanna try to avoid images and screenshots for code snippets or at least images without alt tags. Although to be honest, I would avoid images altogether because then if you use an image, you, people can't copy and paste code examples. And I think it's nice when documentation is interactive. We can also within the code itself, we can avoid variable names that have no context like foo, bar, baz. And finally, I learned the hard way that <laughs> on some screen readers, if you have trailing spaces, it'll literally, in your code, it'll literally read out like space, 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 space. So I'm having real trouble with this. So <laughs> along with our code snippets, charts, and other interactive documentation elements, we want to make sure that the words that we're writing are readable and optimized for comprehension. So often what I see is that documentation will have these long, like verbose chunks of text filled with bloated language. And by this, I mean overly complicated prose that are difficult to understand. Difficult for anyone, but maybe particularly for those with a learning disability or who are reading in a language that isn't their native language. So instead, we want to choose our language intentionally. And using plain language is critical for a more inclusive documentation. Plain language means that a document is short, straightforward, and understandable on the first read. One tool that we can use to make sure that our language isn't too complicated is Hemingway Editor. Here you can paste your text and it'll highlight problematic words and sentences for you, as well as offer suggestions. It's available in this web editor. I think there are also linters and integrations for it. It flags mainly like long complex sentences or unnecessary words, or maybe even words with simpler alternatives or passive voice. On the right hand side, it shows you a readability score and we want to keep that down to a maximum of grade eight. And don't worry about the reading level being too low because as the amazing Ashley Bischoff once said, no one has ever complained that something was too easy to read. And actually, if you want more tangible examples of plain language and writing, I would check out her talk from Frontiers. It is gold. All right, so now we have started optimizing our components, but how can we actually test for accessibility on our site? Once you start getting into Ali and the accessibility scene, um, you'll hear, the, hear or see the term WCAG often. And this stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and they're internationally recognized adopted standards produced by the W3C to help us build a more accessible web. Any of the topics that we discussed and much more can be found in these guidelines. So you can always check against those. But there's a lot of information in the WCAG and it doesn't necessarily help. It helps, it's really great if you know exactly what you're looking for. But if we're just trying to figure out what's wrong with our specific website or application, it can be a bit overwhelming. Fortunately, most assistive technologies are free or inexpensive. And this is great because it allows us to go directly to the source and experience the web in a similar way to that some of our users might. Just in terms of screen readers, there are some options like Apple products come with a screen reader built in called VoiceOver. Um, that's the one that I use in my video examples. You can access it if you're on a Mac by pressing Command F5 or I learned recently, I just got one with a touch bar and you have to triple click that the little part where you put your finger. But <laughs> um, if this is your first time opening VoiceOver, you can listen to the quick start tutorial 
and it'll give you um, an interactive tour of voiceover navigation and interactive basics. Or there's NVDA, which is a free and open source screen reader that you can use for Windows. Whether you're using voiceover or NVDA or something else, it's important to recognize that the way you, a newbie, uses a screen reader might be different than the way a non-sighted person or an expert uses a screen reader. If learning a screen reader seems too daunting or time consuming at the moment, the developer tools on most modern browsers have started implementing accessibility tools. A particularly relevant example is the Accessibility Inspector from the Firefox Dev Tools. Um, it's been available since Firefox 61, and once you enable it, you will have access to a panel that outlines the accessibility tree of the current page you're on, as well as features like an accessibility picker and highlighting of the UI items. There are also many free extensions and validators to help us automate accessibility testing and scan for errors in our site. Axe is an open source rules library for accessibility testing, and it was designed to enable developers to automate accessibility testing on their own. It lives in the dev tools, and when you analyze the site, it comes up with the issues, the number of occurrences, um, the element that it's located in, and even suggested fixes. Or if you want something more visual, WAVE is a web accessibility evaluation tool developed by webaim.org, the same folks that did the color contrast checker. It provides visual feedback about the accessibility of your web content by injecting icons and indicators into your page. So once we navigate to WAVE, um, we, it highlights elements. Like in this case, we have our navigation, we have headers. It'll show us that the, all of our images have alt tags, which is great. These are the Slack docs. I don't know why I'm saying R. And it can also show us when we have potential issues. Like this is saying that our links might not have, might not make sense out of context. So the bottom line, really, if you take away anything from this, is that accessibility should be a requirement and not a nice to have. But in order for this to happen, we need to think about how we can change processes within our organizations or open source teams or workflows. So we can create and implement an accessibility policy. An accessibility policy can be anything from a formal document that's posted publicly to an internal set of standards that your team follows. Either way, it should be a statement that outlines your organization's intentions towards your product's accessibility. Take Oracle, for example. Oracle has a dedicated documentation accessibility statement where it gives you warnings about what screen readers might get wrong as you're going through their docs. For instance, it mentions that the conventions for writing code require a closing brace that should appear on an otherwise empty line. And they note that some screen readers may not always read a line of text that solely consists of brackets or braces. Again, they don't have to be made public, but posting them publicly shows your commitment to accessibility and lets visitors know what they can expect from your site. Many of the points I mentioned can be added to your development checklist. Uh, that way you can check accessibility errors before they are pushed to production. And if you don't know where to start, the Alley project has a pretty thorough one that you can use, reference, adapt for your own project. So we can also learn to browse the web from a different perspective. So give yourself like a goal or a deadline, like dedicate an entire day to browsing your web using only the keyboard. Uh, spend an afternoon learning how to navigate a screen reader. Turn your settings to grayscale for a week. Learning how to use assistive technology ourselves can help us build empathy towards people with needs differing than our own who might be trying to access our website. You can also host an accessibility hackathon within your organization or beyond for your open source community. There's a lot that can be accomplished in just a few hours. So MDN actually did this back in September 2018 
And based on the blog post that they published, um, linked here on the slide, it worked out pretty well, I'd say. And finally, you can contribute to open source documentation and help make their documentation accessible. Full disclosure, I added this slide after listening to the keynotes earlier, but I really believe that it is a great way to get both get involved with open source and also to start thinking about and working with these accessibility concepts in documentation. Plus, speaking as a maintainer, both accessibility and docs PRs are usually very welcome. And the combination, come on, it's even better. All right, so again, I've shared a lot with you the past 30 something minutes, and it's only scraping the surface of what we can do to integrate accessibility into our docs. But I, there's one thing that really stood out to me during all of my research that I want to share with you today. This is for everyone is listed as one of the design principles for the UK government. In it, they say, quote, everything we build should be as inclusive, legible and readable as possible. If we have to sacrifice elegance, so be it. We're building for needs, not audiences. We're designing for the whole country, not just ones who are used to using the web. And I believe that if we adopt a similar mindset, that we can create documentation that is truly for everyone. And thanks. <laughs> so, okay, I'll be hanging out in the chat room for a while. So if you have any questions, you can ask them there or tweet at me. I figure that's a little bit easier than me trying to like babble them on screen right now. So there's also the, here the link to the resources that I mentioned, and I will also drop that in the chat. And yeah, that's it. So I know you all had a lot of choices for which session you could attend, and I'm very grateful that you chose mine. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of, oh, I'm really red. I just finally saw myself. But okay, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much.